A regular gold watch became a tool for Michael to escape. He unscrewed the back cover of the watch and opened the casing of the mini tape recorder. He connected the copper wire from the recorder to the gears of the watch. Inserting the metal receiver, he used a rubber band to tie the watch and the recorder together. A simple timed recorder was then created by him. During labor time, Michael buried the timed recorder in the lawn. Only a small part was left exposed to capture sounds. At exactly 9 o'clock in the evening, the red light on the timed recorder lit up, and it began to collect nearby sounds. This way, he could accurately calculate the guard's movements and the time cycle at this location. Michael retrieved the recorder and discovered that the interval between each patrol by the guards was 18 minutes. This meant that when they escaped four days later, they would have only 18 minutes to crawl out of the infirmary window. The seven of them still had to pass through the cables and climb over the high walls. After calculations, it was determined that it would take five minutes for seven people to jump out of the ward window. It would take two minutes for each person to climb across the cable and the wall. Since the rope couldn't bear the weight of two people, they could only cross one by one. This meant that the 18 minutes would only be enough for six people to escape. To maintain stability, Michael only shared this plan with his brother. They had no choice but to kick one team member out. However, when they were discussing who to exclude, Benjamin, who was hiding in the corner, overheard their conversation. This news soon spread within the team. Each of them desired to escape and no one would voluntarily withdraw. Benjamin found Sucre and asked him to monitor Michael's every move. Teabag believed that D.B. Cooper was already old and escaping would be futile, so he threatened him to quit. John and Lincoln were looking for an opportunity to get rid of Teabag. Wiley Teabag had already anticipated everything. Confidently, he informed the others. He had already revealed the entire plan to his henchmen. If he didn't make it safely out of the prison, he would expose everything. After hearing this, everyone remained silent. But John decided to teach him a lesson by bribing the guards. John obtained Teabag's phone records and found the address of Teabag's cousin. John ordered his men to tie up his cousin and release him after they safely escaped. During the kidnapping, Teabag's cousin resisted with a gun and even used his own son as a shield. As a result, one of John's men accidentally killed both the father and son. Upon hearing this news, John felt guilty because he never killed children it was his principle. In fact, he would even have dreams at night where his own child was killed. The next day, John had his men drag Teabag into the workshop. As John's men prepared to kill him, a troubled conscience led John to intervene. He pointed a knife at Teabag's neck, forcing him to swear and voluntarily leave the escape team. Teabag pretended to agree to his request. But when John let his guard down, Teabag spat out a blade from his mouth and swiftly cut his throat while John wasn't paying attention. Covered in blood, John collapsed to the ground. Anything beside Michael could potentially be a tool for his escape. He arrived at the sewer and removed the buttons from his clothes, throwing them into the deeper part of the drain. Listening to the sound of the buttons hitting the ground, he calculated the time it took for the sound to reach him. He determined that the bottom of the reservoir was about one meter high from the slope mouth. So even if he slipped from here, he wouldn't break his leg. Michael looked up at the well opening, which was about four to five meters above him, and then glanced at the smooth walls around him. He thought it would be difficult to climb up from here, but this was the only way to escape, and he had to find a solution. After contemplating for a while, Michael looked at the semicircular drain at the bottom. He took out a plastic bag he had prepared in advance and filled it with clothes as padding. Then, he took out an 8-meter long rope and securely tied the plastic bag to it. Finally, he stuffed the bag into the drain to block it. Next, all he needed to do was open the water valve and fill the reservoir with water. Michael intended to use the buoyancy of the water to lift himself up. To his surprise, when he opened the water valve, not a single drop of water came out. Someone must have closed the main valve outside. The next day, during the collective labor time, Michael used a lever to pry open the main valve, and a large amount of water gushed out. Michael set the draining time to be 3 minutes and 17 seconds, and the water in the reservoir gradually began to rise. However, before the water could fully drain, a prison guard approached. D.B. Cooper promptly coughed, alerting Michael. The guard blew a whistle, signaling the prisoners to assemble and return to their cells. By this time, the pipes were almost filled with water, so Michael immediately closed the valve. After returning to his cell, Michael quickly made his way to the upstream drainage pipe. He took off his clothes, crawled into the water-filled reservoir, and held onto one end of the rope. With the help of the water's buoyancy, he swam to the top. Michael's calculations were extremely precise, and he reached the exact location. He pushed open the well cover and found himself in the pharmacy beneath the infirmary, just as he had marked it. A few days earlier, 
Michael had used chemical agents to corrode the sewer pipe under the infirmary, to avoid entering the wrong room. He had thrown a folded paper crane into the corroded iron plate using a mop. Michael tightened the rope and pulled hard. The drain at the bottom of the reservoir reopened, and the water level quickly dropped. Then he tied the rope to the well cover. Now, the escape route was fully open, Michael arrived at the corroded pipe and gently peeled off the iron plate. He could clearly see Sarah washing her hands, ready to proceed. Michael followed the drainage ditch back to the lounge area, where they had just finished connecting the pipes. At that moment, Lincoln, who was keeping watch at the door, spotted a guard approaching, he quickly alerted everyone, but Michael hadn't made it up yet, and they couldn't let the guard notice someone missing. In order to buy time for everyone, Lincoln had no choice but to confront the guard. Other guards heard the commotion and rushed over to subdue Lincoln. Michael was pulled up by his fellow inmates, feeling extremely happy. He thought tonight they could start the escape. However, no one else shared the joy because Lincoln, the main protagonist, had been taken to solitary confinement, and tomorrow was his execution day. Meanwhile, John was injured and taken out of the prison by a helicopter, while Teabag pretended nothing had happened. The problem was that after their escape, they still needed John's plane to leave the United States. Without John's plane, even if they managed to escape, they wouldn't get far. Just as the prison break seemed to be succeeding, an unexpected turn of events occurred, leaving Michael frustrated with his hands on his head. Everything he had done was to save his brother from prison, and if he couldn't accomplish that, it would all be meaningless. Michael was too hard on himself. He took out a razor blade, heated it with a lighter, and blew on it, rolling up his sleeve, mentally prepared. He found the location of his tattoo and cut into it directly. Sucre couldn't bear to watch, displaying a pained expression. Enduring intense pain, Michael extracted a small black pill from under his skin. This was something Michael had prepared before entering prison because Lincoln was scheduled for execution the next day. He wants to use this little pill to save Lincoln. Michael knows that only the priest can see Lincoln now, so he lies and says that this necklace is important to Lincoln. He asks the priest to pass the necklace to Lincoln, and the priest agrees to his request. When Lincoln gets the necklace, he knows that his brother will never give up on him. He carefully studies the necklace and opens its case, discovering a black pill inside. There is also a note that says to take it at 8 o'clock. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they are called out to work. They go to the break room, and Michael officially announces that they will leave at 9 o'clock sharp. Teabag looks confused and says that they will be taken back to prison at 5 o'clock. Michael takes down the plasterboard from the wall and touches the pipes with his hand. He swings the hammer a few times and smashes the pipe. Brad quickly arrives, and they all sit on the floor like a group of children who have made a mistake. Michael explains that he accidentally broke the pipe while working, and the whole room is flooded with water. If they don't fix it today, the plasterboard will get moldy. His companions express their unwillingness to work overtime. Brad tells them that they must finish it tonight. Seeing their plan succeed, everyone bursts into laughter. But Michael can't be happy, because his brother is still in solitary confinement. Whether they can successfully save him is still unknown. At 8 o'clock in the evening, Lincoln takes the pill on time. Soon he starts vomiting and having diarrhea, and then the guards rush him to the infirmary for treatment. Finally, 9 o'clock arrives. Everyone lifts the carpet and locks the door with an iron rod. With a command from Michael, they follow the pipeline and successfully reach the pharmacy below the infirmary. When Nike looks at the pipes on the ceiling, his smile freezes instantly. The corroded sewage pipeline has been replaced with a brand new one. It turns out that this afternoon, a janitor came to collect garbage in the infirmary and accidentally saw the corroded pipe. So he asked a repairman to fix it, and they used a thicker pipe for replacement. Using steel pipes doesn't work, which means the escape route is completely blocked. On the other side, Lincoln in the infirmary is also trying to poke the pipe with a mop, but to no avail. It seems that the last time the two brothers will meet is at the gallows tomorrow, to save a person with a rat. This idea is really far-fetched. Michael puts some snacks in his pocket, moves the sink aside, and with Sucre's cover, enters the escape tunnel. He opens the snacks and places them on the ground, quickly attracting a hungry rat, then captures it. Because the corroded sewage pipeline in the infirmary has been fixed, the only exit has been sealed off. The escape team has to return to their cells again. The next day, during rest time, Michael finds D.B. Cooper to seek some solutions from him. D.B. Cooper says that when he was young, there was a person sentenced to the electric chair. Later, because the fuse of the electric chair blew, the person lived another three weeks. 
Executing the electric chair again requires a series of complicated procedures, such as obtaining a new death warrant and death notification. Michael ignites hope once again. Three weeks are enough for him to prepare for the next escape plan. So, Michael comes up with the idea of using rats to sabotage the circuits. He never expected that such a perfect plan would be ruined by a small thief. Previously, in order to get into the prison factory, Michael promised the hip-hop guy that if he retrieved his watch, he would let him into the prison factory. However, with too many members in the escape team, Michael rejected his inclusion, which left him resentful. Brad, unable to find any leverage against Michael, bribed the hip-hop guy with a hamburger. He made him his informant to spy on Michael. The hip-hop guy told Brad about what he heard regarding the electric chair and Lincoln. Brad immediately went to the execution room and ordered his men to test whether the electrical circuit was functioning properly. They went to the electrical room and upon careful examination, they found that a rat had damaged the wires. In order to ensure that Lincoln's execution proceeds smoothly, Brad demanded that the electrician fix the wires immediately. And then he headed towards Michael's cell. When Michael saw Lincoln, who was about to be executed, the two of them didn't say anything, they just held each other tightly. Lincoln still couldn't escape his fate of being electrocuted. Michael wanted to make one last struggle, but his brother had already accepted reality. Lincoln knew that many people had sacrificed too much for him. Perhaps this was his destiny. In the last few hours of his life, all he wanted was to spend them quietly with his brother. The time for the execution quickly arrived. As Lincoln was a repeat offender, he was personally escorted by the warden. However, while Lincoln was being transported, the governor suddenly called. Earlier in the morning, Michael took the opportunity of administering insulin to inform Sarah about Lincoln's framing. He pleaded with Sarah to seek justice from her governor father. Due to Michael's charming personality and multiple encounters with him, Sarah developed feelings for him. So she sought out Veronica, the lawyer responsible for the case. She brought the evidence collected by the lawyer to her father. Just when everyone saw a glimmer of hope, the warden spoke up. It turned out that Lincoln had been framed by the vice president, and he was simply a scapegoat. The governor, concerned about his own political career, certainly wouldn't care about the life or death of a small individual. 